today, we have this event in celebration of uh, Asian American and Pacific Islander Heritage Month. And our guest speaker here is Dr. Mike Yoshiki. He's a professor of sociology at Richmond College. And what he'll be discussing today is kind of the history of Japanese Americans in the US and kind of uh, the connections from their history to today's uh, social issues. So if you guys want to help me in welcoming uh, Dr. Mike Yoshiki. Thank you, thank you. Am I on? Good morning. Sideways. couldn't believe that they could force American citizens out of their home with no reason. became a potential combat zone. Living in that zone were more than 100,000 persons of Japanese ancestry, two-thirds of them American citizens, one-third aliens. We knew that some among them were potentially dangerous. Most were loyal. But no one knew what would happen among this concentrated population if Japanese forces should try to invade our shores. Military authorities therefore determined that all of them citizens and aliens alike would have to move. This picture tells how the mass migration was accomplished. Neither the Army nor the War Relocation Authority relished the idea of taking men, women, and children from their homes, their shops, and their farms. So the military and civilian agencies alike determined to do the job as a democracy should, with real consideration for the people involved. Notices were posted. All persons of Japanese descent were required to register. They gathered in their own churches and schools, and the Japanese themselves cheerfully handled the enormous paperwork involved in the migration. The residents of the new community set about developing a way of life as nearly normal as possible. They held church services, Protestant, Catholic, and Buddhist. They issued their own newspaper, organized nursery schools, and some made camouflage nets for the United States Army. It will be fully told only when circumstances permit the loyal American citizens once again to enjoy the freedom we in this country cherish, and when the disloyal, we hope, have left this country for good. In the meantime, we are setting a standard for the rest of the world in the treatment of people who may have loyalties to an enemy nation. We are protecting ourselves without violating the principles of Christian decency. And we won't change this fundamental decency no matter what our enemies do. But of course, we hope most earnestly that our example will influence the Axis powers in their treatment of Americans who fall into their hands. My father and his family were in these camps. So I'm going to give you some anecdotal information about what I know of the camps some of my insight and thoughts of how we can apply some things learned. So they call my generation, third generation Sansei. I'm also part Yonsei, fourth generation on my mom's side. That means uh, my dad was born in the US. His uh, parents immigrated to the US, uh, maybe around 1920 or so. Uh, 
Many Asians at that time immigrated to, the, to find work and there were these pull factors. They weren't necessarily pushed out of their land, but they sought a, a better situation. And uh, during this time, uh, a lot of immigrants were coming in to do work, like you've probably heard of the Chinese you know, working on the railroads, and uh, a lot of the Japanese came actually to Hawaii to work in agriculture. Uh, so my father's family had my father in Seattle and they settled on the west coast. Um, that's him there. They brought with them somewhat of a Japanese culture. This culture was kind of a more of a conformist culture that you f followed your father, you followed the mayor, you followed the emperor, you, uh, everything worked kind of in sync. And Japan's never been colonized, so there was never this maybe outsider to deal with. So this culture of conformity might play a role in some of the effects of this internment. So my grandparents, my dad's parents, were born in Japan. Um, and they came here and worked, I guess, you know, working class jobs. They had a house in Seattle. Um, my grandmother taught Japanese at home. My mom was born in Hawaii, kind of near Pearl Harbor. And, uh, she has a whole other story that we can go into. You know, her um, father was born in Hawaii, and he actually uh, joined the army at, uh, during the war, uh, mainly to visit a girlfriend he had in Japan. So, uh, but my mom's father's mother was one of the famous picture brides that they uh, looked for husbands in Hawaii. I don't know why they couldn't find husbands in Japan. There's probably some, some issues there. But there was uh, quite a few brides that, kind of like male brides, match.com kind of thing, that they would hook up with husbands in Hawaii, who they thought were well-to-do and had their farms and all that. But then they got to Hawaii, and you know they were just laborers there. So. That's how my mom's side started. So when my dad was born, and my mom, and my mom's father was, were born in the U.S., they were considered citizens. Um, he grew up in a typical American lifestyle, you know, as a kid. Um, he was born in the early 30s, played baseball, listened to jazz, um, you know, pretty much the American thing. The Japanese immigrants wanted their kids to assimilate. So they would, you know, encourage this, uh, to be involved, you know, in American culture. Uh, but they weren't fully assimilated. Like my, most minorities, they are visible, you know, they are involuntarily visible and they're seen, you know, with, uh, in an oppressive way. There is stigma, and these, these are like the traits of kind of a minority definition, according to sociologists. Uh, they also marry within their own group, uh, so they're not fully assimilated. You probably can't see this, but in general, immigrants are treated in various ranges from, you know, embracing, I don't know if that ever, does that ever happen, to, to genocide. Um, or, you know, expelling immigrants, exploiting immigrants, uh, segregation, assimilation up to pluralism. So, uh, we'll see how the internment is covering a few of these uh, 
population transfers and segregation. So during his time before the war happened, there was prejudice against Asians. There have been since, you know, before the 19th, the, the 20th century, uh, mainly because they were different. They were, you know, the, there was a language barrier. There was competition for jobs, labor. Uh, Asians had their own businesses, which, you know, created more competition. And this also included uh, Chinese. So there was this atmosphere of, um, you know, stigma. There, was, there were hate groups. There was uh, kind of this uh, white privilege. Um, and they, as the war uh, was approaching, you know, there was more tension with Japan. So the Japanese um, uh, living in the U.S. were more suspect as it approached the war. Um, there was a lot of local discrimination, like uh, kind of like Jim Crow laws for, for Asians and Japanese. There were um, laws trying to prevent ownership of land, um, trying to prevent them from being naturalized citizens. Um, there was, you know, resistance of, of them marrying into, say, a, like a white family. There was even government surveillance and reports, analyses done on the Japanese. And actually, one major report uh, that Roosevelt commissioned said, the local Japanese are loyal. You know, they're not a problem. So during the war, notice uh, relocation, you know, for our protect, you know, for, it's, it makes it sound, sound nice, I guess. Same, same with internment, you know, it's not a prison, it's not a concentration camp, it's relocation to an inter internment, sounds like a vacation. So the executive order was made, does that sound familiar, uh, that we must uh, round up the Japanese, uh, anyone with Japanese ancestry, whether they're citizens or not. You may have seen the poster that went up around the, the cities, mainly around the coast, around the west coast. And um, most of the Japanese immigrants were on the coast. There was not that many inland. So one character you'll see in this presentation a lot is my aunt, Aunt Mary Ann, and uh, she was actually photographed by Dorothea Lang, the famous photographer, and published in uh, books. So combined with this suspicion of the Japanese and the invasion, this hysteria grew to a point where uh, the government issued this order and started rounding up uh, the Japanese. So between 110 and 120,000 Japanese, including maybe two thirds of them citizens, were put in these camps. Buses came around and they picked them up and uh, you know there were a lot of promises made like you know it's it's only for a short time it's nice you can bring your 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 stuff we'll watch your you know house and, and things like that but um, you know why did the Japanese go along so easily with that well I guess one was you know these promises seemed okay you know it wasn't that bad maybe it's for our own protection. Um, also, remember the culture of Japanese history of conformity? You know, you, it's in the culture that you obey your authorities, obey your community, your leaders. And even though they were partly assimilated, that culture still follows this conformist attitude. Uh, so they could only bring maybe two bags, it was like two take on, carry on, two carry ons, and the buses would 
ship them off to interior like uh, Utah and California and uh, none in Texas. I think there were some actually German POW uh, camps in Texas. Um, so my dad was sent to Utah, the uh, Topaz camp. They uh, were there for three years. Now, during this time now, after the war, there were laws that were put in place. Like, and some of them were local, some were um, uh, federal. The, the internment executive order, of course. There were proclamations uh, banning certain things that Japanese could do. There were asset freezes on bank accounts. Uh, there was a curfew, there were loyalty oaths given, Japanese had to sign loyalty oaths that said, you know, we're not going to follow the Japanese emperor, um, which it was worded in a way that it was kind of ambiguous that you're kind of damned if you do and damned if you don't. There was a registry, you know, a Japanese registry. Everyone had to sign where they are and uh, who they are. And actually, some were allowed into military service, uh, not immediately, but they can uh, bypass going into the camp if they join the military. And there were military regiments that were sent to Europe of Japanese uh, Americans. Of course, there were the social problems, the day-to-day -day discrimination, uh, hate crimes, harassment, uh, you know, couldn't get served at a restaurant, um, attacks, lynchings. Even the Chinese were mistaken for Japanese. You know, a lot of the Jap Chinese said, I'm not Japanese, you know. Um, but, you know, they would get attacked because people would think they're, they're Japanese. And what's the difference? How can you tell? Uh, there were even radical Japanese, well, that, at, that were considered radical at the time. S like in Hawaii, there was this fighter jet that, or uh, a Japanese fighter that crashed, and the locals, uh, were, you know, picked him up and cared for him, and they were accused of maybe hiding him from the authorities. And it's not really clear exactly what the intent was. And also, it was a, a really confusing time. It was during the actual attack. So you know, what, what would you do in that, that situation? So they were you know, imprisoned for being radical Japanese. This uh, flight ban was uh, in a proclamation that you could not fly, you could not travel, you could not leave. When you were in the West Coast, you know, people knew Japanese were being rounded up around there. And, you know, maybe you should move inland to avoid that. But no, there was a ban on that. You could not move uh, and escape that internment. There was also a communication device ban. You know, well, they didn't have cell phones at the time, or they didn't check your Facebook uh, uh, passwords or anything, but, you know, you couldn't have cameras or things to make codes or, uh, you know, even things that reflect Japanese culture were suspect. You know, if you taught Japanese at home, you were very suspect. If you had Japanese artifacts, artifacts that was, you know, very suspect. You are working with the oppressor. Uh, so that's you know, why a lot of Japanese culture was lost during this time to look, really look American. So what happened during this uh, internment time? What was the actual loss? Well, there's a few of them. One was, there was a family structure that was very traditional, man, men as head of household, um, you know, this Japanese cultural obedience, that was disrupted in the camps since, you know, it was a different living situation. There were multiple families per, per room. There was uh, small jobs around the camps, like picking vegetables,
that maybe the kids would do and make more money than the father. And then there's this uh, power imbalance in the household. Uh, so this created a lot of uh, uh, conflict within the family. Health-wise, health declined. There were many heart attacks, cardiovascular disease, uh, you know, probably because of the stress, the change in food, the diet was, was different. Um, <clears throat> it may have not have been the, the most sanitary of places because they used horse stables, racetracks, you know, horse racetracks, uh, lots of flies around, no screens, so it was not very uh, healthy. There was, of course, the mental health issue of, you know, the loss of uh, control, self-esteem. Um, you can't fall back on your old Japanese cultural things or maybe even comfort foods. Um, now, the kids, what did the kids think? Like my father, he was maybe, what, 10 or so in the camp. They were kind of unaware of the politics, and they would you know, go out and play a lot, but they would sense their parents' anguish, and that affected them. So um, this also loss of trust, loss of being an American, they were not uh, trusted anymore. So you have no culture to, to fall back on, really. You're not really Japanese, and you're not really American. So it's this loss, sense of loss that uh, uh, was created. And some were shot to death, mainly escaping, I think, uh, some um, uh, uh, mentally disabled Japanese were, were shot because they didn't understand. You know, they were trying to run away. Now, in the camp, my grandmother was actually separated from the rest of the family because she taught Japanese at home. And that was suspect, right? You know, you're teaching the, the enemy's language. So she was considered a, uh, like an enemy alien and put in a different uh, camp. She wrote a letter to my Aunt Marianne, who you saw at the beginning, and this basically says, you know, my dear Yoko, Yoko was my aunt's name, um, basically the motherly talk, you know, be nice to your siblings, I made this doll, don't fight, drink your milk, uh, say hello to people. So, you know, letters could be sent between camps, and she actually, wrote this in uh, easy Japanese because Yoko wasn't a, a native Japanese reader. She was you know, being taught by her mother at home. You know, her first language was English. So it was in Japanese, but the easy form of Japanese. So did my um, father and his siblings see their mother again? We'll get back to that in a minute. So after three years, the war ended. The uh, uh, intern, intern, internees uh, were released and given $25 and a bus ticket and, and say, and, you know, they were said, you know, good luck. <laughs> um, it's hard to start from scratch because you've lost everything. You could not really have saved your house because of you know, you couldn't pay taxes, uh, it was get broke, broken into and, you know, stolen. Um, some had no connections, some were too old, some were too sick. Um, you know, that, that kind of problem. Now, my dad had, I think his sister found some job in Chicago, so they all went with her to Chicago, where, where I was born. And then, um, 30 years later, the U.S. finally apologized and actually paid reparations of 20,000 bucks that uh, it went to the survivors, but I don't know, maybe half of them might have died by then. So uh, this 
apology, of course, wasn't from anyone that was actually did those deeds back then. So what do I think of this? Oops. Well, um, my dad, you know, got on his feet. He had some college, worked an engineering job. Um, he married endogamously another, you know, Japanese American. Um, I think this generation has a, a more don't make waves attitude because they have seen what happened uh, and the loss of the self-esteem maybe from the parents may have been passed on to the kids. So, uh, you know, many of them achieved a lot, had a lot of some education, but not really made it to the top. It's just respectable jobs. And by the way, um, one of his sisters was one of the first Japanese American jazz singers in the US. So, you know, that's kind of an interesting thing for an oppressed minority to be in pop music, in jazz. Uh, her stage name was Teal Joy. So the Japanese have really assimilated now the third generation, my generation, basically don't speak Japanese anymore, have uh, you know, a lot of non-Japanese friends, and many marry exogamously, you know, marry outside their race. I don't know if that's, this is a, a necessarily a good thing, but uh, we're assimilated. And sometimes the Asians are considered the mi model minority. You know, we are good Americans, we achieve things, uh, we're just like Americans. But, you know, does that really mean vanquished, that our, our Japanese culture is really not existing anymore, or, uh, or what? I call this ROI, that there's a lot of education Japanese uh, attain, but the income really doesn't match the education level they achieve. So it's a bad return on investment. Now, is, let's uh, look at the uh, lessons learned from this. You know, could the Japanese Americans have achieved more? Could I have been something bigger? Now, you know, uh, if it weren't for this obstacle in our family history, um, you know, do your textbooks teach this? How many have known about this before you went to college, actually? Boy, it's like, <laughs> okay, yeah. So, uh, you know, I guess that might, may be a pattern. You know, a lot of the dark days in the U.S., are really not uh, brought to light. And let's look at a, another short video clip. We've done it with Iran back, uh, back a, a while ago. We did it during World War II with Japanese, which, you know, call what you We've done it with Iran back, uh, back a, a while ago. We did it during World War II with Japanese, which, you know, call it what you Come will, on. maybe, maybe you're wrong. Not, you're not proposing we go back to the days of internment camps, I hope. No, 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 I'm not proposing that at all, Megan. Right. But it's, I'm just saying there is precedent for it, and I'm not saying I agree with it, but in this case, I absolutely believe that a regional base... You can't be citing base... Japanese internment camps as precedent for anything the president-elect is going to do. Look, the president needs to protect America first, and if that means having people that are not protected under our Constitution have some sort of registry so we can understand until we can identify the true threat and where it's coming from, I support it. If they can prove to me that they are putting the Constitution of the United States first, then they would be... A candidate just like everybody else. My entire career, I've hired good people, great people, regardless of their religious orientation. So wait a minute, are you saying that it is um, uh, that Muslims have to prove there there has to be some loyalty proof? Uh, some yes, to the Constitution of the United States of America. Well, would you do that to a Catholic, or would you do that nope. to a Mormon? Nope, or? I wouldn't. I wouldn't, because there is a greater dangerous part of the Muslim faith than there is in these other religions. Let me ask you, how many Muslims are in America? 
I, I don't know the number off the top of my head. So you're saying that law enforcement should surveil a number of Muslims, and you don't even know how many Muslims are in America. What I'm there saying... There are three million Muslims in America. Name one community, one city, where we have a, uh, a you, large you, group of radicalized Muslims. You, you have communities. You have communities, for example, in Minnesota. You have communities in Michigan with, with heavy concentration, and you, ha you have incidences of radical imams preaching jihadism. And do, you for, do you go to mosques and sign these people up? And the Different places. You sign them up at different, but it's all about management. Our country has no management. Who's is that? Would they have to legally be in this database? Would it be their they have to center? be. They have to be. Let me just tell you, the, the key is people can come to the country, but they have to come in legally. Thank you very much. Mr. Trump, why would Muslim databases not be the same thing as requiring Jews to register in Nazi Germany? What would be the difference? Is there a difference between the two? Is there a difference? You I'm with NBC News. Is there a difference between requiring Muslims to register and Jews? You tell me. You tell me. In the wake of the attacks in Paris and San Bernardino, Muslims around the USA, the rhetoric against them has become increasingly incendiary. A few weeks ago, armed protesters picketed a nearby mosque in Irving. In Virginia, tempers erupted at a meeting over building a mosque. Every one of you are terrorists. I don't care what you say. Last night in Philadelphia, a severed pig's head was found outside a mosque. And voice messages like this one left on an answering machine of the Dallas chapter of CARE, the Council of American Islamic Relations. You're not welcome here. I hope you get sprayed with pig's blood. That since the Paris attacks, the group has received more reports about acts of Islamophobic discrimination, intimidation, threats, and violence targeting American Muslims than during any other limited period of time since the 9-11 terror attack. The U.S. had such a registry in place for nine years. It was called the NSEERS, or National Security Entry Exit Program, developed largely by Chris Kobach when he worked at the Department of Justice. One of the things that we did right after 9-11, I say we, the Justice Department, was implement the NSEERS system, which took people from high-risk countries and required that they check in after 30 days. Immigrants and visitors from more than two dozen countries were required to check in, be interviewed, fingerprinted, and monitored while they were in the U.S. Virtually all of those countries were predominantly Muslim. America. Muslims are everywhere. But the one place you won't find Muslims is in the image behind me. Hassan Minaj has more. Islamophobia. In case you haven't noticed, it's still a big problem in America. Islam hates us. We need to empower law enforcement to patrol and secure Muslim neighborhoods. We better wake up and smell the falafel. Now, as a Muslim living in the United States, I've learned how to deal with it. I just act super white, like a brown Ryan Seacrest. But what about those people who look Muslim but aren't? Like Sikh American Waris Aluwalia. He says he was prevented boarding his flight because of his turban. He refused to remove this cherished symbol of his faith. A turban, which as a Sikh he wears everywhere, but for some reason it makes people uncomfortable. Almost every time I fly back to the US I get a secondary screening. And it's not just a problem at an airport. It's not just a problem for, for me on the, on the streets. And I'm, I'm always wondering why, why do I get profiled? I think it's the whole Okay, so yeah, people assume that that's kind of an observation I've, I've noticed. Uh, and this is my anecdotal observations of these similarities between what happened then and maybe what's happening now. Is of course, there's social, social harassment. I'm kind of ordering these of it's possible, it's being talked about, and it's, and it's happening. Uh, sanctioned hate. By sanctioned, I mean it's kind of allowed by authorities to happen. Hate groups, uh, extreme right-wing groups that cause hate and harm. Uh, Anti-miscegenation, remember, you know what that means? You know, anti-marrying outside your race, you know. You need to marry within your, your own race, those attitudes. Attacks on ethnic symbols, the Japanese, you know, uh, storefronts and properties were vandalized and, and damaged and, you know, that happens at mosques here. Attacks and lynchings, you know, in both situations. Uh, the mistaken attacks, like you just saw, the, the Sikhs are, are thought to be Muslim, 
the, some of the Chinese were thought to be Japanese back then. Uh, extermination attitudes, or at least the attitudes are occurring. I'm not saying it's, it's, there's extermination yet. Uh, also, you know, surveillance. Yes, the Japanese were surveilled on, um, and it's maybe thought to be happening here. Uh, you know, there's FBI infiltrators in uh, American mosques. Uh, assets are frozen you know, back then with the Japanese and now with certain, you know, some charity organizations, their assets are being uh, frozen. Alien land laws. Uh, I know there are Muslim cemeteries nowadays. There's a big um, uh, resistance against, you know, those and also uh, Muslims moving into neighborhoods. Loyalty oath, well, that's being talked about. Uh, the Japanese, you know, did sign things. And I actually, you know, I actually, I don't know if you heard on the news of uh, when some uh, Muslim leaders here went down to Austin to talk. They were given, you know, a loyalty oath to sign, which is ambiguous. It's, it's another damned if you do and damned if you don't sign it. Uh, but, you know, that kind of expectation that you need to prove your, your loyalty. Naturalization ban, um, there's talk about it with Muslims today. Uh, and it was, you know, definitely a, an issue during the World War II. Curfew, well, there's, I don't see a curfew happening with Muslims. A registry, yeah, that's being talked about. And travel ban of various types. Mainly it's with uh, immig immigrants, refugees, but still many Americans are being detained or prevented, especially when they had the big uh, first travel ban uh, a few months ago. And internment, is that coming? Well, we'll see. The future, well, if Muslims were undergoing the same internment, yeah, there would, or any, any minority group, you know, this can happen to any minority. Psycholog psychological trauma, uh, family dysfunction, physical health effects. Uh, this is a positive thing. There were supportive demonstrations supporting the Japanese during World War II, you know, by white Americans. And the, the same is happening with Muslims today. Uh, now, finally, it, there was the renunciation of the executive order saying, OK, we don't want to intern the Japanese anymore. You know, let them free. So there's a renunciation. Um, you know, would, would there be an apology if the government was interning you know, another group today? Uh, would they get 20,000 bucks? That's not worth as much today. Um, would they become a model minority? You know, finally let out of the camps today and achieving and being good Americans. Um, would they become white? I don't know, have the Japanese become white yet? Do you know what that means? Um, it's kind of accepted into the dominant majority culture. Um, I don't think we... You know, it's like it's been said the Irish became white, the Germans, the Italians, the Jews. Um, I don't know. I don't know about the Japanese yet. So, what I conclude is there is a pattern, not only with you know the Japanese and say Muslims today, but what's happened in the past and maybe what will happen in the future. Uh, a lot of the government actions uh, lead to hysteria, promote hysteria. Um, and perhaps Muslims won't face the internments, but they're facing a lot of the other detrimental effects. Back to my aunt. Remember her mother, my grandmother wrote to her from the other camp. My grandmother was considered an enemy alien because she taught Japanese. So, uh, did, did my 
father and his sister and a sibling see her again? No, she died in the camp. My grandmother died of a heart attack and um, she never did see her kids again. So my aunt is, uh, you know, the one pictured in here in a few books. And this book uh, actually uh, interviewed my aunt later on. And uh, my aunt said, you know, she was separated because she taught Japanese. She died of a heart condition. And it's, she's sad that her mother died alone. Let's talk. Any uh, observations? You're as talkative as my classes. <laughs> How do Japanese feel about Americans who move there and try to integrate into Japanese culture? I don't know. I don't know. We're so re removed from Japan that um, 
I just don't have any personal knowledge of that. Um, so you haven't been back or something like that? Well, I've, I've visited Japan a, a few times, but I'm, uh, you know, I can't communicate with them. I don't know what really what, I haven't interviewed them. I don't know what they're really feeling. You know, they'll always, always put on a, a happy face there. Uh, but in general, the Japanese are fairly uh, a closed group. Outsiders are viewed with suspicion. So um, it's probably not as open as other places. I was a member of the Japanese American Society of Fort Worth for many years. Uh, all right, OK. I attempted to learn Japanese, but I had to drop out of Japanese for the most of that. Yeah, me too. Yeah. Um, well, they couldn't bring that much, and any Japanese literature was viewed with suspicion. So, you know, they they would try to hide it, or you know, it's not bring those things in. I don't know officially if they checked for those things, but uh, it would be dangerous to bring cultural artifacts into the camps. <laughs> When he was explaining. He didn't talk about it that much. And since I've always heard it a little bit, you know, from day one, it was kind of the, the no, you know, it was no big deal. It wasn't like some big shock that came to me at, at some point. It was like I would always hear about this. And he would, of course, not try to terrorize me. He would, you know, say, he would say, you know, they played stuff and, oh, he did, you know, I was doing something. And he's, he would say, oh, he did this, you know, same thing in the camp making things and uh, toys and stuff. So, um, so unfortunately, I don't have a, this big shock or epiphany about, about this kind of thing. It's kind of like, it's always been there, so. Have you lived somewhere besides Texas? I grew up in Chicago, and I moved to Texas for, to go to school and so just stayed. Well, um, since I was the age, age, my age was so different between the two, it's hard to compare. Yeah, there was some discrimination in Chicago, like, you know, in grade school. And I think those kind of things, minor d discrimination, prejudice are, you know, will, will occur in uh, schools like that. But since I came here, it's been in college, and I've kind of surrounded myself in certain disciplines, and you know, not with Middle America generally. So, someone here? Yeah. Yeah, how do I feel? Well, I don't feel very good about it. Um, uh, one reason is that I am now a Muslim. This is my wife, Basma. Obviously, she's a Muslim. Um, so it's, it's a more of a personal attack now rather than academic. Um, I don't know. You know, I don't talk about my feelings easily, so I, it's hard to know <laughs> what to say. <clears throat> what? Uh, worries would be traveling, um, mainly my wife traveling. Um, and if I traveled, I would, you know, clean up my Facebook page. Um, you know, try to get rid of, you know, anything that might offend, you know, anyone, you know, higher up. Uh, you know, I have many friends that are, are Muslim, and uh, I see problems they actually have with hate and harassment and uh, travel, you know, things like that. So when you're actually personally in the, the group affected, it's, uh, it takes on a personal uh, issue. Mm 
They don't think she's Japanese, do they? No. No, no, no. no. Okay. Mm, yeah, kind of a another related issue. Yeah. Yes. Are you in any form of discrimination whenever you notice Japan and can't communicate with Japan? What was your first few words? Oh, are you discriminated in any way? Like you discrimination in any way? I wouldn't know. I don't because <laughs> I I can't understand them. I don't really, you know, it's hard to read people. I not obviously. I think when I'm stepping off the plane. You know, they think I'm Japanese, but I, th I think I notice some irritation when I don't understand them. Um, so, you know, that's a, a whole other body of research to see what the Japanese now think of the Japanese internment here. I haven't really uh, delved into that issue. Okay, what else? Come on, raise your hands. <laughs> um, people, I think I am more Japanese now because people expect me to be Japanese. You know, when, when there's these expectations, you know, you kind of uh, uh, turn into those expectations. So, you know, I've learned a lot about uh, Japanese food and culture from YouTube. Uh, so. <laughs> I know how to eat sushi now. You know, you gotta keep your rice clean. Don't put soy sauce in your rice. Um, Do you enjoy learning more about Yeah, uh, yeah if, I, if I have the time to, um, I don't have much time to go into these, these pursuits, but, um, since I'm teaching the issue, who's taking or has taken sociology here? Yeah, a lot of you. Okay, so, you know, those classes allow me to teach a lot of interesting things that gives me a reason to learn. You know, like about the um, how to eat sushi, you know, in, in the culture chapter of my sociology. Uh, you know, uh, I teach ethnocentrism or cultural relativity in that, that lesson. Um, you know, I had to, you really have to learn a lot more when you teach something. You know, just in case there's any questions or the reasons of anything. So I had to learn more about this myself to be able to, to teach it, uh, to talk about it. Uh, so, yeah, it's fun. I mean, you should, you should teach, so, you should be sociology professors. Because you get to, uh, you know, bring in any example, you know, that you can shove in there to uh, explain theory. Okay, what else? Um, yes? Wait, I can't hear you. What would I do to help the Muslims? Well, as a social scientist, you do research, you look for patterns, you um, uh, come up with hypotheses and what ifs, things like that. Um, so on a professional level, you know, I try to create things like, like this. On a personal level, I participate in demonstrations. Um, you know, I actually cross the line from science into activism and try to help local uh, groups, Muslims, uh, mosques, and uh, agencies like uh, CARE, C-A-I-R, you've seen in there. Um, so it's hard to make change individually, um, but have you noticed the, the demonstrations and protests that are occurring now with a lot of different issues? You know, that, that wasn't around 20 years ago. It's, it's amazing how many uh, protests are happening now. And you guys should go to protests. It doesn't matter which side you're on. Just go and see them and, and just, you know, choose a side and see what they're into. Uh, 
you know, I went, I go to the immigration marches in Dallas, and, you know, one time there was, you know, like a half a million people there. It's like, you feel the power. So if enough people feel like they want to help or uh, uh, pissed off about something, these numbers start creating, combining to create the synergy to make a loud message. And that's kind of the starting of a social movement to try to change attitudes and, and laws. So that's what I do. What else? Yes? How long were the camps? Three years. Not that long, right? You could survive three years. <laughs> Okay, what else? Yes? Okay, so um, do you think that Muslims are being, they're able to keep their culture more so than Japanese? Um, do they, yeah, um, that's an interesting question. First of all, uh, what country are Muslims from? Many, many countries. Yeah, there are actually more Asian Muslims than Arab Muslims, uh, so we have to ask, are they keeping their culture, you know, ethnically? Um, if they're immigrants, often they want to assimilate, so they, it's a combination of keeping their own culture and assimilating, um, especially if they're looking for work. They want to do everything to try to, to settle here, find work, you know, make a living, that kind of thing. Um, actually, I, for, I forgot your question. <laughs> what were we talking? Oh, are they retaining their culture, or how, to what extent? Uh, half and half. The uh, the religion itself, uh, some there's a range of religiosity. Muslims are not all the devout, you know, five prayers a day Muslims. Uh, some are more lax and some are more, more strong. So the religion part, you know, many are retaining, and that could be done fairly privately, um, other than being the, uh, the visible hijabi with the scarf. Um, so it's kind of a yes and no to that question. And I, I am not a scholar I haven't done that much research into it, but just what I've seen so far, that's, that's my opinions. All right, so unfortunately we are out of time today, but thank you, Dr. Yudashiki, for joining us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for joining us today, and thank you, Professor Scrantz and Professor Blaine. Um, I do have Tracy over here. She's going to uh, kind of talk about